Okay, I apologize. I have a feeling that's going to be a constant thing. This thing's not working. I guess I got the one they used this morning or something. But it's not charged up. That's a heck of a time to find out. I swear the green light was on when I when I came out here this morning. But what do you know? <laughs> no, nope, it's dead as a doorknob. That's okay, you're loud. Is it loud enough? All right. What do you do? Can you hear me? Yeah, I got all your loud there to me. Okay. <laughs> That's why I bring my own mic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's why he brings his own mic. <laughs> okay, where's Doug? <laughs> where's Doug? You want to boo him? No, we probably shouldn't. No on camera. Maria is a lady of few jokes. <laughs> Serious minded lady. Law and order. That's us every time. Sounds like my late mother in law. Your late mother in law. I guess they would want you to do All right, man. Sir, can I get you to step? Just a little bit of it. There you go. Oh, there's Steve and Kate. Katie, I wish you were here. No? Okay, all right. Are you ready? Okay. I'd like to welcome everybody to Gettysburg National Military Park. My name is Matt Atkinson. And I'd like to welcome you back to Devil's Den. If you're first seeing the show now, six years since 2013, since I was last out here. I really don't have anything about the doors to say. I've kind of moved on as far as this moment in time is the doors. I have. I know a lot of you want to do the celebration of the lizard. Uh, out here, which turned out because I just I just did that on the spur of the moment when I walked up here. Uh, but more of these days we're into uh, more like in Georgia doing time, hearing that lonesome uh, whistle blow, if you know what I mean. It's kind of slowed down a little bit. Uh, this is my boy. This is old Ben Atkinson. Why don't you stand up for everybody? <laughs> Hank Williams Jr. got his start. His mother pushed him out on stage when he was eight years old because she needed to make a living, and he was it. <laughs> so Ben said he wanted to come to the show today. He wouldn't have missed it for the world. And we got out here in this 95-degree this heat, and I said, I bet you'd miss it now, wouldn't you? <laughs> <laughs> so we'll see if he'll uh, read a few things for us uh, before the program's over. All right, so let me give you a backup, a little bit of a setting uh, with Devil's Den before we get going. Uh, basically, if you've watched the tour on, what is that, YouTube, uh, which has been so popular over the years, uh, we're going to take up basically where we left, where I left off six years ago. It's not what I intended to do, but that's basically what we're going to do out here. So to set up everything and to briefly rehash what we did six years ago, we're now standing on uh, Houts Ridge, better known as Devil's Den. If you want to get real technical about it, Devil's Den is down here in the parking lot back behind the camera uh, or behind you right now or in front of you, good people. Why would you wear a beard shirt when you don't have a beard? So, um, on July 2nd, 1863, take me a second to get in the flow of things here. This is the end of the Union line for most of the day. All right, at least the portion that Sickles moves out. Everybody focuses on the 20th Main and Strong Vincent and Joshua Chamberlain, etc., and Little Round Top uh, directly behind you. But the actual end of the Union line for the majority of the day is right here. You could argue and argue and argue it. Okay, first things first Smith's Battery, Smith's New York Battery. 
The guns are right over here where you see the monument, obviously the artillerymen, etc. We at the park belabored this point for a long time. Where are the guns right here? Where are the guns at the wall? You'll see the wall in just a few minutes. I'm going to try to keep you in the shade as long as possible. Or where are the guns up on top where you see that monument to the 99th Pennsylvania? All right. We finally, not me, but somebody ran across uh, an account where they were dedicating the monument, if I remember correctly, and Henry Hunt, the federal Ar chief of artillery here with the Army, came to the uh, reunion or the monument dedication. Never fails. One car. See what you're missing by not showing up, PCN people? You know, it's a Honda. This guy has no idea what he just drove to. Right? <laughs> <laughs> He's deeply disturbed. Look at this. Yeah. Oh, he got three of them. No, he didn't get the Denali though, he got the Tahoe, I think. That's <laughs> that man doesn't know what's going on. He's he has no idea what's going on. <laughs> At the reunion of Smith's Battery, Henry Hunt shows up and he makes a remark which is recorded. And he says to him, to the survivors, that he would have court-martialed Captain Smith, if he would have placed the guns where this monument is being dedicated. All right, he makes that remark. So what does that tell us? The guns are actually up on top of the ridge. They put the, the War Department put them down here so you could see them when the trot, when the uh, carriages came through. All right, you want your monument to be seen. So on July 2nd, 1863, switching to the Confederate side, if you look off in the distance, you can see Warfield Ridge, uh, better known as Seminary Ridge, but everything has to have a specific name here in Gettysburg. <laughs> but on the on the evening or mid-afternoon of July 2nd, Hood's division of James Longstreet's Corps is going to start forming up in those woods over there to jump off for the attack. This is around 3 o'clock in the afternoon when they're doing this. Uh, John Bell Hood is probably the best combat commander in the Army of Northern Virginia, and his four brigades underneath him, one from Texas and Arkansas, one from Alabama, and two from Georgia, are some of the best combat troops that this country has probably ever produced. If you don't believe it now, you believe it once I get you in the sun and you get to look up, not down. <laughs> you, see, you see what you think about taking this hill right here. So around four o'clock in the afternoon, they're going to jump off. Uh, I'm going to stand up. All right. <laughs> As you can see, we brought this handy foam board out here, complete with pictures of exactly who we need right now. All right. This gentleman on the left is Evander Law. He's going to be the commander of the Alabamians. He will be on the extreme right. He will be coming out of the woods. And our brigade that we're following today, Bennings, Georgia Brigade, this guy is supposed to be following this guy right here, okay? So keep that in mind because I'm going to come back to it. These two gentlemen right here in the middle. This is going to be Jerome Robertson, who is in command of the Texans and Arkansas men, Deep South boys. Robert E. Lee wrote, uh, the senator from Texas in the Confederate Congress, after one battle, I have to have more of them. Please send more. Because <clears throat> they're some of the best troops. And then you've got right over here, Ty Anderson, who is going to be backing up uh, the Texans as they come out. You could have put it in order a little bit better. <laughs> <laughs> so these two are on front. These two are behind. Okay? Uh, Law and Robertson in the front rank, the two Georgians, Benning and, and Anderson in the two rear ranks. When they get ready to come forward, they step off. Now, in researching this program, I came across one of the few uh, observations. Don't everybody start salivating at the mouth because there's not much to it. But a Confederate veteran actually noted seeing General Longstreet and General Hood riding along the lines before they stepped off to go into conflict. Uh, they were told... You ready to read? 
Making his debut, everybody. <laughs> we were ordered to dispense with everything but canteen, cartridge boxes, and haversacks. And we and here we drew fifty cartridges to the man. While all of these preliminaries were going to General Hood and Long Street were riding coolly up and down in front of us, seeming to examine every man. He's done. <laughs> I'll be getting a lecture at McDonald's tonight. But... Daddy, I didn't appreciate that. <laughs> so here they step off. All right. When Benning reported in his after-action report is that Hood told him before being wounded around 2 to 3 in the afternoon that the division would assault the Union left. I always found that interesting, that it's 2 to 3 in the afternoon and the brigade commanders are just now learning they're going to assault. Benning was told to follow Law's brigade. So he is supposed to follow him. That makes natural sense. You want to keep the two brigades together. Uh, Benning was told to keep a 400 yard interval between himself and Law's Brigade. Upon emerging from that wood line though, it would take, uh, maybe they weren't quite even, you know, one behind the other, but definitely Benning is behind there. Uh, when Benning comes out of the wood line, he sees the brigade in front of him advancing. And of course, his orders being to keep 400 yards distance, guess what he does? He follows the brigade as it goes <laughs> forward. Hello, Doc. So, as they start to come forward right through here, Benning is almost all the way probably to that first ridge. I've never heard a name for that ridge right there, but that ridge right in front of you right there. When he suddenly realizes, I don't know how he realized, but he suddenly realizes, dun, 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 that it's not Law's brigade that he's following. <laughs> right? Here's your first here's your first error that's going on this day. He actually, when he came out of the wood line, the Alabamians were over here concealed in the woods and he never saw them. And it never dawned on him that it might be the wrong unit. So here it comes. Your first thing you ought to know today is Rock Benning is not supposed to be here. Right? He's supposed to be over there but as fate would have it rock bending is going to be at the right place at the right time okay uh now here we come to the leadership qualities of rock bending john bell hood is wounded early in the advance you see that farmhouse right there hood is wounded to the right you can't really see it that well but if you follow uh, the distant wood line, it would have been to the far right, as you can see. Uh, somewhere in the Bushman uh, orchard. We don't know the exact spot. Okay, so, when Hood is wounded, what happens? The division becomes rudderless. It's like a ship without a rudder. What does a ship do without a rudder? It just goes where it wants. It drifts. Wherever it wants. It has no direction. And that's exactly what's happening in the Hood's division. Uh, Hood's wounding from a Union standpoint could not have come at a more timely occurrence. From a Confederate standpoint, it could be, it could not have come at a more worse timing. Because once Hood goes down, the four brigade commanders are basically on their own. Now, this is not the point of the talk here, but I have never understood why Longstreet does not come down here and take command of this division. Well, he had to know Hood was knocked out of the saddle. He should be down here controlling that division because this is the weakest part. Instead, you've got Evander Law, who's all the way up on Big Round Top, who's got to come all the way down here to a fluid situation. He has no idea what's going on. Oh, he, he set out this morning he was a brigade commander. Now he's supposed to be commanding four of them. So what does law do? We don't know much about law. 
And there's good reason for that. I don't think he had much to do. <laughs> All right. Without any orders, this is what makes Benning so good. Benning perceives, quote, the first line would not be able alone to carry the peak. So I advanced without halting again. Simultaneously, Hag Anderson's boys are going to be coming in to his left. So the two Georgia brigades are actually shifting into the Rose Woods as far as Anderson, and then you've got Benning's boys coming directly over the crest of that ridge. In fact, they probably cover that entire ridge. You want to see what a brigade front would be. Where you see those woods in front of you, all the way almost to the Rose Woods to the right. Okay? Happy little people walking along the road. In the middle of the PCM. Okay. <laughs> We're going to leave shortly. The Georgians opened up on the Federals and began to reap their harvest. Now you couldn't, as I said, you couldn't have painted a better uh, time, though, for Rock Benning's Georgians to come in here. Henry Lewis Benning is his real name. Watch yourself behind me. Henry Lewis Benning is born in 1814. Anybody want to keep on going? In 1814, <laughs> took the little trip along the Mississippi. Something, the Mississippi. something about took the big ribbon ribbon. Took the little thing, took the little thing, and then we fired up on the British at the town of New Orleans. Fired our guns and the British kept coming. Wasn't that some big ass? All right, all right. <laughs> Well, that that was hi was my was completely unplanned. All right, so there you go. If I can get you my Confederate artillery. All right. So Benning is later going to attend Franklin College. Is anybody from Georgia today? Thank you. Anybody from Georgia? Franklin College, I did not know this, is the, is the forerunner of um, UGA. He subsequently moved to Columbus, Georgia, and resided there for the remainder of his life. Benning gained admittance to the uh, bar, meaning law, at the age of 21. He married in 1839. He was quite a busy man. They had 10 children. <laughs> With five daughters surviving him, right? He had one son. Always, you know, he had one son, and he lost that one son in the war. Can you give your country any bigger sacrifice than your one son? Showing signs of early secessionist fever, in 1850, Benning attended the Nashville Convention, which foreshadowed the compromise of 1850 with Clay and Douglas. <laughs> In 1853, I was surprised by this, he's elected by the, by the uh, Congress, Georgia State Congress, to the Georgia Supreme Court. His most famous ruling for the lawyers in the crowd who will not admit their lawyers today <laughs> was his 80-page decision in Paddleford versus Savannah, where he held that the, I'd like to see this today, where he held that the United States Supreme Court and the State Supreme Court of, of Georgia were co-equal. Uh, <laughs> um, his, paper, his paper is known as one of the best examples of strict construction arguments on record. Now you're getting deep into constitutionalism right there with strict, strict constructionism. In the late 1850s, he was a major force in the Democratic Party, attending the Charleston Convention in 1860, and later serving as the Vice President of the Democratic Convention in Baltimore that nominated Stephen Douglas. He later addressed the Virginia Convention. After Georgia had left the Union, Virginia's undecided, Benning went to Virginia and spoke on behalf of Georgia. So he must have been an eloquent man, they're gonna let him get up there and have that position. He's so eloquent or so good that Benning was considered for a cabinet position in the new Confederate government, but instead he chose the infantry. His first command will be the 17th Georgia Infantry, which he led as a colonel. Benning is combat hardened by now. 
by Gettysburg. He went on to fight every engagement except for Chancellorsville. At uh, the Battle of Sharpsburg, it was Toombs Brigade, which the 17th Georgia was part of, which actually defended Burnside's Bridge. Mm -hmm. You didn't wear Burnside. You know who's going to talk about Burnside? I'm here, sir. Oh, you're Burnside? <laughs> All right, well, we got Burnside down here, if you like. Oh, you want to be Burnside, too? we got to no. get some mutton chop. <laughs> <laughs> we got wood chop and mutton. you got to get some Burnside, no pun intended. Um, <laughs> Benning, we think, even though the 2nd Georgia and the 20th Georgia are the literally the units defending at Burnside's Bridge at Antietam or Sharpsburg, we think that Benning, I asked John Hoptak about this, so it better be right, okay? <laughs> we think that Benning is actually the one in command at the bridge. So that should give you an idea of some of his prowess right there. All right. Um, Benning commanded the brigade at Fredericksburg, and when Toombs resigned to go into politics, Benning received his brigadier commission on April 23rd, 1863, to rank from January 17th. It was this brigade, Toombs' old brigade, that he led onto the field at Gettysburg. His steadfast, steadfastness in critical situations led to the sobriquet Old Rock. Here comes Old Rock. And his favorite expression in battle was, I guess you can bleep this out, right? Oh, Maybe. <laughs> Give them hell, boys. Give them hell. That's all he ever said. <laughs> well, what more do you need to say? <laughs> all right, I'm going, to re I'm going to repeat this until y'all are actually sick of it, okay? But the brigade is going to come into formation in the following order from left to right. 15th Georgia on the left. We'll cover them first. We're going to go from the left all the way around to the right. Sorry. 15th. 20th. 17th and 2nd, I'll repeat it one more time, 15th, 20th, 17th, and 2nd. And I've already found discrepancies with Harry Fonz. I think he'll need absolution. Yeah. yeah. Well, the dark clouds roll up. <laughs> 300 people. Guess who's the only one that gets fried? <laughs> that would be me. All right. This is something that's interesting. I found interesting. Out of the four regiments that are in the brigade, every regiment in Benning's brigade produced a general during the Civil War. I did not know that. Okay. So here they are. The second Georgia's original commander, the guy, the unit over here, was Paul J. Sims. Oh. Mortally wounded here. Now this is the one I couldn't guess. William Duncan Smith. William D. Smith, the original commander of the 20th Georgia, later became a general. The 17th obviously produced Benning. And the 15th Colonel here at Gettysburg, Colonel Dudley DuBose later became a general in his own right. His total numbers here for four units was 1,420 men. All three regiments numbered around 350 men, with the exception of the 15th Georgia, which was 368. Right there. All right. I see him, I see him. <laughs> see him? You see him? I see him. I see him. Is that a Henry Hunt quote? Yeah. You see him? You see him? You see him? They must have really wanted to come up here. We got to do something. We should do something with 300 people with these cars. We? <laughs> I mean, we got enough for That's racing, a roadblock. Yeah, the roadblock. The road. You could lay down in the road. We could have some kind of protest. <laughs> then I could call. Then I could call Maria. <laughs> yeah, I'll get the party started. 
she carries those plastic wraps. Oh, <laughs> get every one of y'all too, I guarantee you. <laughs> I don't doubt it. Why not put um, pre-cut laundry? Yeah. Let's not, maybe we don't talk about doing illegal things on camera. Yeah, like, don't that's, yeah. that's not the best idea we've had. Yeah. This is a family show. Yeah. <laughs> all right, what you need to know is, I already told you the Bennings Brigade is going to go to the wrong spot. They're following the Texas Brigade. They shouldn't be following the Texas Brigade. They're coming over that crest. Benning realizes the, the mistake he's made. He can't, he can't rectify it now. Now, I'll get into the actual fighting in just a second. But when they get up here, here's what's happening as the Georgians come up. Law's Brigade is going over Big Round Top. At some point, somewhere as they start to ascend the hill, they're going to get word, or Law is, that he needs to shift his two right regiments to his left. So in other words, the original setup was the 4th Alabama, the... 15th. No, I didn't that. 47th, 15th, 44th, and 48th. That's left to right. He takes the 44th and 48th. Y'all come up here and have 300 people stare at you, and then you have to reel off five numbers in a row, which aren't you take You take 44 and 48 and take them from the right and bring them all the way around to the left. What you need to know is those two Alabama units are coming through that swell right there, down there. These Alabamians are making their way, trying to bridge the gap between the Alabamians and the Texans. The Texans have uh, bumped apart. When they got somewhere down in this general area, when they get down here in this general area, the 4th and 5th Texas stayed with the Alabamians. That's why they attack up toward the 44th New York Castle. Then the other two regiments in the Texas Brigade, the 1st Texas and the 3rd Arkansas are going to be attacking from right out here in front of us. So there's only two regiments and they are going up against Smith's Battery, as I've already said, the 124th New York, which we covered on that first program, then the 86th New York, then the 20th Indiana, and then the 99th Pennsylvania on the other side. You like I'm a 99th Pennsylvania reactor. So. Oh, you like that? Huh? Okay. <laughs> yes, the 99th Pennsylvania is on the far end. When the attack first starts, most people don't realize this. Keep this in mind. When the uh, when the Texans and the Arkansas boys attack up uh, Houck's Ridge here, they are outnumbered almost two to one by War Hobart Ward's Union Brigade. And the words of Tom Holbrook, my fellow ranger, Hobart Ward. Just like saying the name, Hobart Ward. <laughs> Hobart. Okay, thank you. So, the attack quickly comes to a halt. That's the big thing you need to know. The Texans can't move them as they're coming up. And here comes Rock Benning's Georgia Brigade to go into uh, the middle in between uh, the two ranks. Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So let me try setting it up right here. I'm standing up. Okay, so what we have right here in this general vicinity is the 44th and 48th. All right, Georgia, Alabama. I'll get it straight. We're coming right through here. The 48th is on the right, the 44th is on the left. I'll get, I'll, I'll go over it again once we get down there. Over here, we've got the 1st Texas and the 3rd Arkansas. The 1st Texas is basically at the base of this field. You'll see it in just a minute. The 3rd Arkansas is completely in those woods. And what you have right here is a gap. I'm going to make the gap as big as I can, but they don't have any men right here. Well, guess what? Here comes Rock Benning. Face that way. All right, here comes Rock Benning's Georgia Brigade with his left flank is going to come up behind the 1st Texas. His right flank is going to come, I don't know if they ever join with them, but they're going to be basically connect to the Alabamians over here. In other words, what I'm trying to tell you is you couldn't have picked a better spot for Rock Benning. 
to come mm -hmm. into, and he didn't even mean to be here. <laughs> That's the great thing yeah. about it. Thank y'all. Thank y'all very much. Right? So they come out here, and this is where the attack is going to start. Give me a citation. <laughs> All right, so we're going to, just give me one second to reload here. We're finished with this stop, but what we're going to do is we're going to make our way in just a second to the triangular field, and it'll take a while to get everybody down in there, uh, but we're going to approach it uh, through here and then hit the trolley path, and we're going to go all the way around, okay? Okay. What do you call yourself? <laughs> Video assistant. What, we, what is our job? Production. Production. All right. Well, I was telling him you're either going to have a live productionist or a dead productionist. But regardless, you don't run off from this one. I think you'll stick. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Jess. She's petrified. All right, well, yeah. Slow and steady. That's what I heard this is the game at TCM. Give me a heads up for it. I think that's the end. Are you ready? What's your rain tolerance with that thing? <laughs> now the first year, the first year he was out here, he had a he had a, a board. I don't guess we're getting that. Oh, you had that clipboard. Remember, it had the white on it. Yeah. And you could hold it up. No, we're not getting that. No, I'm using yours. I sneak it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, did everybody make it down here? No. No? No? No, no, no. All right. So, where we just came from, you hear me up there, Jason? Where we just came from, ladies and gentlemen, is we basically did the, the charge of the 124th New York. We're not doing Confederate, we're doing Union right now. So, when if you go back and look at the other tape, you, they will talk about, I'll talk about the 124th New York or Cromwell and, and uh, Ellis, and they charge down this hill. Meeting them right here is the 1st Texas. The 1st Texas is lined up somewhere. I imagine they're behind that mound of earth, which is directly in front of the camera right now, up there. Wave to them, Jason. I would have, if I was a Texan, I would be up there right now, and I would probably be out to my uh, right, wherever you see... Uh, the Phillies fan with USA. I think we have a Civil War Trust member right over there. We won't talk. Oh, you like the Phillies? Okay, well, <laughs> you and him should get together later, I guess. Y'all can swap beers. And so what the 15th Georgia says when they're coming up, and all I found this very interesting, is Bennings, Georgia, 15th, which is on the left. Remember, 15th right here. 20th to my right, 17th and 2nd. So we're going to follow this brigade line as we go around through here. The 15th Georgia, one participant said that they got up here and saw the Texans advance twice. I never knew how many attempts the Texans tried before, they, before the Georgians got here, but according to the guys watching from this ridge back here, the Texans try to take this position up the triangular field twice. So there's some trivia for you that comes out right here. Okay, so the Georgians are coming in. 15th Georgia is on the left. It advances faster. You don't have to be a rocket scientist. You just have to walk the battlefield to figure this out. The 15th Georgia gets here first because they have the shortest distance in order to engage the enemy, the Union in this standpoint. The further you go to the Georgia right or to your left over here, the further distance the rest of the brigade has to cover, like a swinging door. So the 15th Georgia 
is going to halt somewhere in this general vicinity. Rock Benning, the general, personally tells Colonel DeBose to halt because the 15th had advanced ahead of the other three regiments. What does that tell me? Benning is on the left flank, the Confederate left flank, when this engagement begins. He's somewhere in this general vicinity. Then he leaves to go where he should be, where's the rest of the brigade to get them into position. That leaves DeBose by himself. The colonel of the 15th Georgia estimated he was within 150 yards of the rear of the 1st Texas when this happened. Benning then went toward the right. Quote, the colonel says, I rested a few minutes in this position until I saw the balance of the brigade had moved up even with my position and were still advancing. I ordered a forward movement and soon gained the point where our advanced troops were fighting behind a stone fence. After fighting the enemy for a short time, I saw from the heavy musketry on my right that the other portion of the brigade was hotly engaged trying to carry the hill. I immediately ordered my regiment to jump the stone fence and charge. So he hears musketry over here. He orders the 15th Georgia forward. A Texas store. Before this, George Baynard, flag bearer of the 1st Texas, said that he advanced with the, with the Texas uh, color guard up to a, 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 a large rock. I wish I knew where that rock was. You got to keep in mind that they moved a few boulders to put this old trolley path in here. So I always hesitate pointing out, well, this might be the spot or this might be the spot. Because this galvanized, this trolley path galvanized the preservation of this battlefield. The veterans did not like them blowing holes through these boulders back in the day in the late 1800s. All right, so George Baynard, the flag bearer, said him and the color guard, when they first got here, rushed forward. And they were huffing it because Baynard said he got behind the rock, he felt secure and everything, and he hadn't even got himself a blow in order to regain his breath yet. By the time he looked around, there was five other Georgians sitting there with him from the 15th Georgia's color guard. So the 15th Georgia's battle flag went up with the 1st Texas. And George Baynard from the 1st Texas was absolutely livid. He goes, he says to them, uh, what are you doing here? And he says, we're looking for cover and we're trying to get the men to advance. And Baynard says, well, you'll soon see that you're attracting more attention than you want. And sure enough, Boehner moved, and a Union shell comes in and explodes right at the place he was just at. Now let me tell you something how history differs. And I know I'm talking about the first Texas, but this out goes to show you how stories change. If you get out Fonz's book, he has footnoted from Texas, from Texas veterans about Boehner being out here and getting hit and having to be physically held back from charging up the rest of the hill that the Union shells splintered his flagstaff and sent him reeling, but the Texan was still coming on. Uh, that is the story in the book. I found an account, though, from the 1890s by George Baynard himself, and the man says when he gets up in front of the old veterans, he says something like, there's nothing worse than talking about yourself. And he proceeds to tell the story. He's behind the rock. The Union shell comes in. The Georgians come up. He's very angry about that. He moves. The shell explodes. Except in his account, he ought to know what's happening here. It blew him down the hill. And it hit him. It knocked him senseless. And when he came to, he didn't know where he was anymore. And he tried to get up, and he went. I don't know if this is what his veteran comrades remembered, but in his confusion, probably concussion, concoosed, he went the wrong way. <laughs> he went toward the Union lines instead of the rear, and the Texans grabbed him and turned him around and pointed him the other direction. <laughs> and that's the way he went off the field. So much for bravery. But he got back. I'm not saying he was a coward. I'm just saying he was too, he was not too senseless to even go forward again. He made his way back to the hospital, and he literally had to ask his comrades the next day what had happened to him, because he didn't know. He didn't know how he got in the condition he was in. So anyway, 
The Texans and the Georgians are all cramming up here. Um, the Colonel DeBose of the 15th Georgia went on to say that the 15th <laughs> Georgia's assault was successful in turning the right flank of the Union line, opposing the rest of the brigade. He must be talking about the right flank of the 124th New York. The way it looks to me, the 15th Georgia is basically, along with members of the 1st Texas, are headed in this direction. I always pictured them as going in this direction, which we could both be right. I'm splitting hairs right here. But if they go this direction, that will put them on a course to where they set up for the rest of the battle. Now, I'm not going to get into this today, but suffice it to say, long story short, or the end before the beginning right here, the 15th Georgia goes all the way into Rose Woods, basically joins up with the 3rd Arkansas and the rest of Anderson's Georgia Brigade, and they fight successive actions against various uh, Union units in there, uh, in the woods. It's a, it's a pretty good account. I'd like to do a walk in that in its own right. All right, so William Thomas... Huh? No, that one. Yeah. No, the F word. <laughs> F L U K E R. I told you. <laughs> Fluker? Or Flucker? <laughs> Fluker? I think. I think the first one for accuracy, the second one for fun. <laughs> yeah. Fluker. How does that sound on the mic? Fluker. You like that? It's an R-rated version on this tape, huh? He is from Tolliver County. Spelled Talifero. But it's pronounced Tolliver. All right? Don't you come down the south and say Talifero. Tolliver County, Company D of the 15th Georgia. My revolutionary ancestors were Tollivers, and my second cousin, Miss Mary Hickman, always corrected me on the uh, uh, enunciation of Tolliver. Right here. He was a member of Company D of the 15th Georgia. He recounted his experiences for the Washington Chronicle, the newspaper, in a series of articles in the 1890s. He is the one that recalls the Texans making two attacks up the hill before the Georgians joined them. Here's your eyewitness account. Here Benning's Georgia Brigade was ordered to the charge. We raised a deafening yell and went over the rock fence and up the hill shouting and yelling like demons. The 15th Georgia Regiment faced the batter. We went straight up to the top of the hill, took the guns and met face to face for the third and last time in deadly, almost hand-to-hand -hand combat, combat. Fluker talks about pressing Ward's brigade back and the stand made by the remnants of the brigade on top of the hill. That's probably in the edge of Rose Woods. He then proceeds to what we call in the modern word, talk smack. <laughs> Quote, such an engagement couldn't last long and was only a question of marksmanship between Georgia and Ireland from New York. He thinks he's fighting the Irish Brigade. And Georgia won. I'm sure there's a few Irishmen in there. And the Irishmen broke and fled in disorder, leaving the greater portion of their number dead and disabled on the field. Right through there. Uh, he goes on to talk about advancing into the Rose Woods. I won't read the whole thing, but I, real, I, will, I will read this little short paragraph. Quote, the slaughter in our front was simply beyond description. The ground in front of us was covered in places with dead men. Where a line would stand before a few moments, it was marked as distinctly by the line of dead as it ever was by the living. I saw them in one place as they fell, three deep piled on each other. I saw scores of them fall from their ranks during the evening. I thought at the time, and think yet, that the death rate in our front would exceed five to one of us engaged. All right, the 15th proceeds in the Rosewoods where they join the left flank of Anderson's brigade and probably the third Arkansas in there too. And here they advanced, they retreated, they advanced, they realigned. 
they advanced, they retreated, and, uh, and et cetera. You get the picture. But definitely did much fighting as, with the ebb and flow of Anderson's attack. When Anderson's Georgia Brigade gets thrown out of the woods out here, right, they regroup. The 15th Georgia comes out with them, and when they attack again, the 15th goes in with them. Pretty much how simplest way I could say that. Any questions? What time did this occur? About that time. <laughs> Probably, I don't know, 530? I don't know, this whole action, they probably take this ridge. I'm talking Benning now. Benning's whole action that I'm describing here today might have been to, from here to the top, they pause. They pro, you're probably talking about 15, 20 minutes to get up to the top. Now, the Union counterattacks are another thing, but they couldn't have lasted that long. Not with everything bearing down on them. So you're looking, you're, it always, it always... Uh, bedevils me how short a time all this combat really takes most of the time these veterans think that it was a multi like days of course because it seems like it yes no it's it's pasture yeah yeah it's open all this is open in fact, I, I went back, uh, Gary Edelman uh, wrote an article for Gettysburg Magazine in like issue, don't quote me here, like issue 20 or something like that. And he has a picture from the top. Most of y'all don't remember this, okay? Mm -hmm. But from his picture, everywhere we're standing right here is nothing but a solid piece of wood mm -hmm. all the way up to the stone wall at the base. So the park, you remember when we went through that in 1999, they took away all this, or we wouldn't be standing out here in the middle of it today. That's one of the great things that the former superintendent, John Latcher, did for this park, because that was not without controversy, jerking a tree out of a park, but he did it, and we're the beneficiaries of it. Anything else? <clears throat> I don't think it's going to rain, is it? It already did. All right. Okay, what we're going to do is, if you'll let me get in front, I do not know where I can park all these people, but the worst part is over, I think, quote unquote. I'm going to get in front, we're going to follow this trolley path around, we're going to go down to the 20th Georgia, and I'm going to give you different sites. What I want you to do, because I can't stop every five minutes and give you all these accounts, too many people, what I want you to do is keep looking to your left, Look to your right where the Georgians are coming from, and more importantly, look to your left, and you'll get angles that you have not seen before of how the Georgians are going to attack this field right here. We all focus on the triangular field. This attack actually engulfs this whole ridge, which is what we're going to do today. Okay? All right, who's the person who needs help? Okay, so they're going to come that way. All right. Well, that's interesting. Okay, that's the, this is going to take a while. Ben says there's 351 people on this tour. It's almost like a whole thing. That's what Ben says. Now I'm thinking I'm getting my money's worth from the public education system. I wouldn't stop here. I didn't plan on stopping here. Uh, the gentleman that's got is suffering from heat or whatever. I do have help on the way, okay? Well, that, the Custer's coming now. <laughs> you watch for them. They coming from that, that yeah. You're going to have to deal with yeah. Mm. Yeah. And now official casualty. There's paperwork involved. Okay, so what we're going to talk about is, I wasn't going to stop here, but the... But, oh. <laughs>
I'm so used to Stuff Rider, he doesn't give me any cues. It's just raw filming. Right Can you see me from that angle? <laughs> Taylor, what's going on over there? <laughs> I told you, so if you don't know, if you haven't been here and you happen to be watching from your home, if you can pick up this, turn up your TV speaker, you can now hear the police sirens coming for the gentleman that's no longer sick. So we're going to have the camera turn around in just a couple minutes to see Maria come out here and, and oh, for no reason. <laughs> All right. So what I want you to do is, the reason I stopped here is because we got cloud cover. I was going to keep on walking, but I couldn't pick up the missed opportunity. Most people never see this. Now look behind you. Now you can see where the Georgians are. What did that Georgian say? He said it was about 150 yards behind the Texans when he halted. You can judge 150 yards the same as I can. So they're going to be somewhere over there, roughly on that ridge right there. The 15th Georgia will be where I'm pointing, over here to the right. All right, the camera's tilting that way now, that ball spot on the hill. The 20th Georgia should have been coming somewhere from in front of you, where those woods are. Smith's battery, New York battery, noted that, that uh, let me get this straight, that when the rebels were in the open, they used spherical case, which is an exploding cannonball filled with shrapnel. When the rebels entered the woods, they switched over to shell, which is a hollow cannonball filled entirely with black powder. So I don't know, I guess you're trying to catch the woods on fire, for lack of a better word, right there. But anyway, these Georgians come out, the 20th Georgia, and now if you look toward this area, this is a scene which most people never look, or never get to see. You can see our intrepid somebody over there, I don't know who it is. 352, that's what we have right there. 352, counting that range. There you go. Is that Jason? I thought Jason was with us. All right, well, whoever you are, I'm happy to have you. Um, as the 20th Georgia came up to the base of the triangular field, this is what most people look. Can you imagine being Harry Fonz and having, no matter how many times you've, you've, you've walked this field, can you imagine being Harry Fonz and having to try to describe this terrain with a typewriter in all the different directions? People do not give him enough credit for, for this is not a simple task. Now, what I want you to look at is look at that lip. This is, what would this be, the southern edge, southwest maybe? Uh, side of the triangular field where you see this this edge right here now you can see how the 20th Georgia is going to make their way up to the side of the triangular field what I'm trying to convey to you is is that except for the occasional Union soldier over here around the boulders the 20th Georgia is pretty much sheltered they're not receiving that much fire as they approach now once they get to the top of the hill they're probably in for it but right through here is probably where they dress their lines, get everything together, and continue that final uh, uh, ascent uh, to the top of the hill. As the 20th Georgia came up to the base of the triangular field, a Texan recalled, they started to mistakenly shoot into their own friends. In other words, they started shooting the Texans. A.C. Sims wrote, the 20th Georgia, not knowing they were coming to our support, supposing us to be the enemy, opened fire on us, but our color bearer, George A. Bernard, stepped out in the open space and waved our flag, the Texas flag, to and fro, who, when they saw the Georgian cease firing. All right. Now, in the midst of this, this is a good story. This may be the best story I tell you. Because we're about to get rained out, and you know, any lightning or anything like that. Oh, there they are. I told you, they're going to back it all the way down here. There you go. we got to get an action shot for PCN. You ain't never had this on PCN before. <laughs> <laughs> Whoever you are, you're now recorded for posterity. <laughs> My wife probably thinks it's me. 
Right it's probably the best story I'm going to tell you all day. In the midst of this, somewhere up on this slope, I wish I knew the exact spot, but I don't think we ever will at this point. Quote, Colonel Jones, the commander of the 20th Georgia was Colonel John A. Jones. Quote, Colonel Jones was killed late in the action, not far from the captured gun, so he's probably up on the top of that ridge somewhere. After the enemy's forces were driven from the position and they had themselves opened upon it with shell from the other batteries, a fragment of one of which, glancing from a rock, passed through his brain. He had behaved with great coolness and gallantry. He fell just as success came in sight. And now for the big moment that I've been waiting on for so long right here. Because this is probably the first time that this name has ever been mentioned on this battlefield before. Right here. All right. 1866. Leonard Jones. That's not the name I meant. Leonard Jones, who was the son of the colonel. All right. Made the trip to Gettysburg to retrieve his father's remains. <laughs> <laughs> well, don't get too too distraught about it. <laughs> On the journey home by sea, he's carrying his father back home via an ocean liner. On the journey home by sea, the vessel sprang a leak and began to sink. The captain of the ship offered to place Jones' remains, probably a small box, you know, maybe even, you know, just maybe something like an urn or something, small box. He offered to put Colonel Jones's remains in the lifeboat. Upon trying to retrieve the Colonel's remains, though, it was discovered that the cabin was too high with water to find them. So the shattered ship and her cargo were left to the mercy of the winds and the waves. The surviving crew and passengers were picked up by the U.S. steamship Susquehanna. All right, you can remember that name, which was bound from New York to Havana. And none other on this ship was a guy named William T. Sherman. <laughs> was on this vessel right here. Young Leonard noted that their party was treated with, quote, little kindness or consideration. <laughs> no remedies and food suitable to their exhausted condition. What do you expect? And this never know. So yeah, William T. Sherman is actually connected to Colonel John A. Jones's remains going down because he picks up his boy in the middle of the Atlantic. Now how is that for a story? You can go <laughs> around the world and never hear anything better than that. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Hear that light applause? <laughs> that means they're being kind. <laughs> that means it was a decent joke. Here he comes, right here. Yes. All right, why don't we why don't we do this? We'll go uh, pass into these trees. Let me get up front, and uh, we'll see if we can get in the shade out here and find out. Give us some. It shouldn't last long. At the end. There you go. Now that's where you do the celebration of the lizard. No? Okay, never mind. We might actually get through this. All right. I stopped you here just simply because you could see me, and I didn't think you'd have as much room right here as you would if I went down. Ideally, I wouldn't stop here. Ideally, if I had a smaller group, I'd take you up here. But we're, we're approximately, we're probably... Maybe on the left flank of the second Georgia. Oh. Okay, let's take two. Taylor, you're supposed to be telling me this stuff. Oh, it's him. Okay, what's his title? Assistant to the productionist. No, okay. He's the productionist. You're the assistant. Okay, y'all want to count him down? Y'all want to count three, two, one? Okay, here we go. Three, two, 
one. All right, we're live. We're back. And we're we are now on the back side of somewhere. Uh, I don't know exactly where. We would be near the slaughter pen to orient you. Devil's Den is back behind me uh, over this hill, this uh, rock outcropping right here. And the, what would that be? The 44th Alabama will be coming through here from your right to your left. If you're one of the participants here, they will be coming through this hollow. The 44th left would, and right would split. Most people don't remember this, but the 44th left flank or left wing went to the left of Plum Run, which is this stream will cross shortly. The right half, I guess, uh, stay, con stay connected to the 48th, and they continue through the wood line. Now, coming up through here uh, would be the 17th Georgia. Should be in this general vicinity right behind us, but I didn't see a good stopping point. And coming right through here, this tail end, we're probably on the left flank of the 2nd Georgia, somewhere in this general vicinity, maybe the center, somewhere in here. So just trying to orient you. I wanted to stop here and read you a story because, you know, I always, and everybody does, I suppose, uh, talks about bravery. Okay, we talk about bravery. I mean, that's all I'm going to read to you. But I did find this story by uh, a confederate named Loki, L-O-K-E-Y, they just keep getting better. Um, and he tells it like it was. He tells about his unit coming through here, and they had a man in the unit that they could not, in the 20th Georgia, that they could not get to fight. And I always think of this. I, I went to, uh, they had the Wizard of Oz showing at the local movie theater, and it was uh, tightwad Tuesdays. And so for five bucks, I went up there. We got there. The movie started at 7.05, and we got there at 7.07 as usual. <laughs> and uh, we pulled up there, and I said, I'll take four tickets. I had my two little girls and Ben and me, and I went up there, and I plopped a $20, down, $20 bill down. She says, no, sir, no, sir, there's no tightwad Tuesdays on special features. <laughs> so so like I went from $20 to 50 <laughs> But there I was. Couldn't turn back now. And I sat in the theater, and they saw the cowardly lion. Ooh. <laughs> Did you catch that? Yeah. <laughs> now he tells you. Now he does it. Well, I wonder what this is called. <laughs> and I wonder what this is called. <laughs> okay. This is what he said. One man in our company had never been able to get into a fight. Our captain had told us to watch him and not let him get out of the ranks. And going into this fight, he was on my right in the front rank. He even remember where he was. The first shell <clears throat> that came whizzing over us frightened him so bad <clears throat> that he broke the ranks. <coughs> Lieutenant Robinson cursed him and told him to stand up in ranks or he would run his sword through him. This man ran away from this fight, went back to Georgia, and hid out for about a year before he was captured and brought back. They got him. I'm more interested in how he got there. He was then court-martialed and sentenced to be shot, the charges against him being cowardice and desertion. Now listen to what this old veteran says about this man. We all believed him to be a natural-born coward who could, quote, not face the music. So we got up a petition for a reprieve, which was signed by every man in our company. We sent the petition to President Jefferson Davis, and he signed it. And it came back just in time to save his life. We thought to intercede and make him a better soldier, uh, uh, and make a better soldier out of him. But as a soldier, he was a failure. And we learned that we could not make a brave soldier out of a coward. They still saved his life. Now, I don't know if he stayed with the unit or not. But there he goes. All right. So, I'm glad we could all get together to share that little story. Right there. Um, we're losing, we're going to lose a large amount of high-ranking officers during this attack. I'm trying to think where this would go. All right. 
2nd Georgia. It's going to be passing right through here. Lieutenant Colonel William T. Harris was leading the command. Quote, uh, General Benning wrote afterwards, Colonel Harris was further to the right, farther to the right, where he and his regiment were exposed to the terrible fire of the two pieces that swept the gorge. When you get on Crawford Avenue, in other words, when you get in your car, you probably already did it, and you turn down to come to, to um, Devil's Den, Little Round Top would have been on your left. Right? Everybody know where I'm at? Yeah. There are two guns. There are two Union guns on your right. He's talking about those two Union guns that were sighted down this gorge. These Alabamians and these Georgians, those two guns really caught their attention. I don't know if you can imagine, I can't imagine myself, rifled shell coming in here and ricocheting off these boulders. I don't know what the velocity would be on that, but the, but the concussion, the sound of it, had to be something deafening, to say the least. But they talk about having to come through canister fire, shell, solid shot, all being thrown at them by those two guns over there. So anyway, a ball passed through his heart, killing him instantly, said Benning. His gallantry had been most conspicuous. Now John M. Bowden of the Second Georgia supplies additional information on Harris's death. This is one of these, these stories you oft hear in battle. Just before entering this battle, Lieutenant Colonel William Harris, commanding the 2nd Georgia Regiment, in the absence of the colonel, called some of his friends around him and bade them goodbye, assuring them that, them that he felt that he would be killed in this fight. And he was killed about sundown in the afternoon as he was leading his command some 20 yards in the advance. About 20 minutes before this, his horse had to be back here somewhere. About 20 minutes before this, his horse was shot out from under him for the charge had been under rapid fire of the infantry and the explosion of shells from the enemy. I saw the brave man when his horse fell. It was an, it was an inspiring spectacle. He straightened himself in the saddle and leaped like an antelope as the horse went down, striking the ground some ten feet in front of his dead horse. Drawing his sword, apparently before he reached the ground, and lifting it high in the air as he struck the ground, he called out, Forward, men. That's, that's pretty cool. He continued to charge, leading his men 150 or 200 yards to what was called by some of the boys, I've never heard this before, but they called this creek you're about to pass right here, Deep Creek. Never heard that before. That's what he calls it. He crossed the creek, so he's got to be. What does it say? He crossed the creek. John W. Bowden says he crossed the creek. So that colonel is going to be somewhere where you see those scrub trees right there. That colonel right there, Colonel Harris is going to fall somewhere in that general vicinity, in this cul-de-sac. Uh, obviously, I don't know the exact spot. Uh, uh, he crossed the creek, but few if any of the, his men crossed with him. They seen that it was impossible to climb the mountain up which he was endeavoring to charge under the terrific fire of the enemy. At this point, still about 20 yards in advance of his command, he fell pierced by the enemy's bullets. And, you know, when I wrote this, I was typing this out at my house Saturday night to show you what a rock and roll lifestyle I lead. Right there. Before I turned on the news. Right there. Had some ice cream. All right. He then goes on to write. Bowden goes on to write. He writes one sentence, and he's got four words in it. And he says simply, he was my friend. And I sat there, when I typed that out the other night, you know, because I'm rapid firing, I paused for a minute. Because, you know, I'm used to, obviously as a Southerner, I'm used to the cadence of Southerners. And most people write as they talk. And I'm sitting there thinking, he was my friend. To a Southerner... I'm sure it means about the same thing anywhere, but to a southerner to write that down, he truly meant that. And however, I forget, I didn't write down when, when uh, Loki wrote this account, or Bowden wrote this account, but 
still, however many years it was afterwards, he was still his friend. So, when darkness came on, he would remember this, taking three other strong men, Bowden and three other strong men, we procured a fence rail, and tying the four corners of an army blanket together, we put the dead colonel in it, and with his body suspended on the rail, we recrossed the creek, he had to come through here, somewhere in this general vicinity, we recrossed the creek and carried him about a mile to the rear, where we dug a hole and buried him, wrapped him in his army blanket together, we put the dead colonel in it, with his body suspended on the rail, uh, thus disposing of one of the most gallant men in the regiment. And for the second time, I don't know where she went, for the second time I have the distinct pleasure of mentioning this gentleman together again. Uh, Bowden said, this is war. And he closed his statement by saying, and General Sermon said, war is hell. War is hell. Right there. He still didn't want to talk about it. Um, all right, any questions? No questions. Is that too somber a story for you? Did they recover his body later? Yeah, they'd recover it. I don't know. I haven't looked up to where he went, though, if he was identified. But a colonel, they usually don't lose a colonel. <laughs> you know, he gets special treatment. But I didn't look to see where, it, where he ended up. If I had to guess, if he went back to Texas, he's probably in the state cemetery, if I had to guess. If they take me back to Texas, they'll never take me alive. <laughs> Seven Spanish angels, nobody? All right, okay, so enough of that. <laughs> if y'all will just stay put for one second so I can stop this column. Al, if you will stay right there, wave to him, Al, thank you. Uh, we, what we're going to do is I'm going to get up front of the column. We're going to make our way through the woods until we break. Uh, break through the woods and we can look at Devil's Den. As you peer to your left, you are looking at the advance of the 44th Alabama and the and the uh, second Georgia as they start coming up. If you, once you can see further, you'll be looking at the 17th Georgia as it comes in the line. All right, you it? You it? Y'all up? We done? Joe, we up? There you go. Not anymore. What they say. I have been looking forward to this stop because I think it's your best. Uh, wait a minute. All right. Okay, we're going to count down from three, okay? All right. Three, two, one. Action. All right, I've been looking forward to this stop uh, coming out here. for. Uh, uh, I think it's uh, working out a lot better than I thought. When uh, Ben and I came out, that's three syllables, by the way, in case you haven't picked up Ben. When Ben and I came out here, the uh, what was it, yesterday or the day before? The day before. When, uh, we came out here, we were scouting this area, and we got here, and I liked the shade, but I was afraid at the time we got here that we wouldn't have any cover. So I'm, I'm very lucky that we have. The main thing I'm happy about is the view shed you have. Now, if you look back to your left, you can see where those two big boulders are up amongst the trees right there. Our last stop was right to the left of that. If we'd have walked up on top of the hill, we'd have been right there, okay, to orient you. Okay, so to rehash, probably coming over that knoll right there where I just pointed out where the elephant rock is directly in front of you, you would have had the 17th Georgia. Coming right through here from your left to the right would have been the 2nd Georgia. I take it that their right flank, remember the Georgians are moving this way, so the right flank's over here. The right flank would have crossed the stream. By this time, the 44th Alabama is somewhere ensconced around those rocks. The elephant rock, and they're shooting up here. Some of them might have even gotten up to the road by that point, but I don't know. The uh, rest of the 44th and the 48th Alabama are back here behind the uh, intern. Everybody wave hello to the intern out there. Hello, intern. Hello, intern. 
he's about to find out about something in about two days. It's something we call in the South called chiggers. Oh. <laughs> and they like warm areas. But you, you can thank Jason for that in a couple days. Just put some fingernail, clear fingernail polish on it. It'll burn, but it'll get it out of there. All right, so you suffocate them. The 48th Alabama is up in these woods along with some of the other 44th Alabama, and they are shooting it out with the 4th Main. The 4th Main at this time is basically where you see those thick bushes straight ahead. The 4th Main is straddling this stream. Okay, so that's the setup. They're stopping these Confederates from coming down this gully right through here, what they would nickname as the slaughter pen, from the main men shooting them, and those two guns, that section from Smith's battery firing down the Valley of Death, which I've already talked about. So they would have been in this hollow right here. So when you get the Georgians, and it starts with the pressure goes from the Georgians left all the way around to the right. In other words, the second Georgia on the extreme right where we are is probably the last to be engaged. Why? Because they have the furthest to go. So that's the reason. So as these Georgians start to work their way among the rocks and so forth, the 4th Maine is it's going to cause the 4th Maine colonel to withdraw the command closer to where you see the 4th Maine monument. If you look out between the two bushes, past the mysterious red shirt man right here. You'll see the <laughs> monument right over there in the distance. You gotta be a true fan to get that one right there. Uh, and the fourth main is gonna pull themselves up underneath the ellipse of what I call it, or the large boulders of Devil's Dam. Where the parking lot is, is where that monument is. If, you, if the flank markers are correct, which is always an if on this battlefield, uh, I'm kind of confused because some of the 4th Main claims to have been up on top of the ridge where the 99th Pennsylvania Monument is, that big one you see up there, but their flank marker is basically halfway up. Anyway, my point is the 4th Main gets underneath those rocks and backs up because they're tired of these Georgians shooting at them from over here and these Alabamians, so they withdraw the command and tuck them in. They get the line tighter. Does that make sense uh, to you? So. We were talking about Bowdoin, and uh, the last thing he was talking about, General William T. Sherman. And he went on to say this about the ensuing combat. When our lines reached the creek, which is right out here in front of you, we found the mountain in front of us very steep. I bet it looked very steep. With its sides covered with large uh, large rocks which the Union had concealed themselves and we considered it impossible to drive them back with anything like an orderly advance. So here we came to a halt and Indian fashioned each man selected a rock or other place for, the co for a covering for himself. Some even jumped into the creek. A continuous firing was thus kept up until nightfall Many men were lying on the ground, dead or wounded, more reckless than some of the others. I had, uh, excuse me, first sentence, more reckless than some of the others, I had climbed up a rock some 10 feet high and had backed myself into kind of an alcove and fixed a plan to kill some Yankees. <laughs> I was so situated as to be protected up as high as my waist on three sides by the rock. After I had fired about a half dozen shots, my attention was attracted by the pelting of bullets around my head as they struck the rock extending above. There was an open field toward the right. And here, some 200 yards away was a dense woods on the slope of a mountain. All right. Oh, this is cool. From the woods and from behind the rocks scattered therein came these bullets. I was being fired upon from three directions, left, right, and center. Upon discovering this, I ret retreated precipitously to the ground below and fell behind the rock for protection. The opening between the rocks through which I had just passed was, say, six feet wide and was grown up with dense weeds as high as a man's head. Boy, you, you testify to that, wouldn't you? When I had reached a place of safety, I turned to see if the Yankees were following. 
but bullets were still pursuing me. And these wood, these weeds, which you just described, have been cut down as with a scythe. So I don't know how he escaped through that little patch, but the bullets are going so thick through the rocks that it cuts down the, the foliage right through there. Ready? All right, start here. We'll read that. We're going to read that. Alright. Taking shelter here, I reloaded my musket and peeping around the rock, continued to fire at the heads of the Federals as they would appear on the hill above. The occasion was at least interesting enough to call into action all of one's faculties. <laughs> my attention was attracted by a piece of bullet fired from the rear which had split against the rock and struck my thigh. Upon investigation, I found to my surprise that four of our own men had selected hiding places along our route of charge from 50 to route. 100 yards. Route. route in the south. Route. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. From 50 to 100 yards in the rear of our front rank. Thus placing us between two fires. What is he saying right here? There's friends of his behind him, and they're shooting toward the Yankees, and they're sh almost hitting him. All right. I called an officer and said to him that I could stand the fire of the enemy in front better than I could that of our own misguided friends behind. The officer set, sent a detail of soldiers to the rear and had the stragglers brought to the front. <laughs> Conan goes on to relate a heartbreaking story. All right, now I'm gonna have him read this, okay? I want to show you. I've read. I read one time in the at the Battle of Spotsylvania Courthouse, where this the uh, trying to think what unit that was off the top of my head. But anyway, there was a count. The Confederates were counterattacking into the mule shoe, and this brave Confederate stepped out in front, and he raised up. One of you has the shirt on. I meant to mention it to you. If you're still here, but he stepped out in front and he raised the Confederate flag and he started singing the Bonnie Blue flag as he led the men into the charge. All right. Well, guess what? There was another one of his comrades behind him that was a little bit more nervous than he was, and he accidentally shot him in the back of the head. All right. Now the reason I'm telling you that is, is that not always do you see bravery working out. Now, I want to ask you something. Now, he's about to read this. This is a short account. What would you do if you knew you were going to, if you were dying? If you had, if your life's blood was ebbing out, and I don't know how long it takes to do that. I guess it's variable. Varies by the amount of blood you're losing right here. If you only had five minutes, if you only had ten minutes on this earth, and you're in devil's den, what would you do? Well, thank you, Pink Floyd. I appreciate that. <laughs> what would you do? Take a red. Well, you're on the wrong side. We're shooting Yankees. <laughs> but you're close. You're closer than you actually know. Now, listen to what happened here. Trust that this juncture and before these men were brought up, a young man who had been fatally wounded, but who was determined to die bravely, had crawled up on a rock where he sat reloading his gun as best as he could and firing occasionally at the enemy. A shot from our own men in the rear killed him. What a pitiful sacrifice. <laughs> pitiful sacrifice. They shot him. Accidentally shot him from the rear. That's how he ended his life. His friendly fire right there. Yeah, that's crazy, isn't it? All right. Any questions? Y'all are y'all are some troopers. I want to tell you what I may not have had a bridge for you, <laughs> but I do appreciate you staying with me. Y'all got two more stops in you. Yeah, yeah. sure. Yeah. All right. What we're gonna do is I'm gonna I'm gonna let you go. Is is uh, you can go. But what I'd like to do is to give you one more angle. Is uh, I don't care how you get there, but let's reassemble where you see that black brigade marker where that car see the blue car coming up it's about to round the corner it's going to go right by that black marker everybody see it we're going to reassemble right there and we're going to make the final push to capture smith's guns from there just tell me when you're ready okay
All right. Taylor's not going to last forever. So we got to get this going. Interns make what? What do they make at PCN? Not an intern. <laughs> Assistant productionist. All right, let's count down. Three, two, one. And don't call me intern. All right. 20th Georgia, let's go over this one more time. 50th Georgia is on the other side of that hill right here, that little crest. Right over the other side of that crest is the triangular field. That's where we started the tour. We went down that field and we went all the way around. Around and around we go. All right, 20th Georgia should be advancing from behind you, which I'm gonna talk about here shortly. The 17th Georgia should be coming from right here behind this area, behind the camera. That is where we made the stop in the middle of the woods. That's the hill. If you went over that declivity right there, over that hill in that declivity, you'd be back where we were before we crossed the stream. And of course, if you look, if you're over here, if you look to your front or right, you look in that area, you got the slaughter pen. And that's where the second Georgia is going to be coming from. So the Georgians, what did I say at the beginning? The 15th Georgia gets to the base of Triangular Field, they, they halt 150 yards behind the Texans, and then they decide to make their way on up to the top. Why? Because they start hearing firing to the right. So they start the advance. It is one continuous yell, probably. Georgia's Bennings Brigade is gonna raise that rebel yell. I don't know how to define it. Right here. The, I don't know how to define it, but each southern state had something slightly different about the rebel yell. Where if you were really attuned, you could tell what state was advancing. So I don't know if that aided Benning's brigade uh, in its advance, knowing that familiar rebel yell, but I'm sure it impelled them onward. I guess I ought to cut the microphone on, huh? So, if you, if you think about it, um, this is the final push. The Confederates are fighting Indian style from rock to rock, and right here where you are, they can see where their objective is. Where you see that girl on top of the rock that's right up there, if you look behind her and see that very tip-top monument, not the artillery, remember, but the one to the left, the one to the left of the oak tree, that is where Smith's guns are. And these Georgians and these Texans seize upon those guns. That is their objective. You want to know what's driving them? It is to get to that monument right there. You are square on the uh, axis of advance uh, for the 17th Georgia. And if once they collide together somewhere in here, the 20th also. J.W. Loki of the 20th said, he recalled his advance up the hill in these terms. After shooting several times, I noticed that several of us were several yards in front of our line on our left. So I dropped back to our line, but not being satisfied with this position, I again advanced up the hill to the right. I guess he's going lower before he goes higher. But I may be wrong. And going up this hill, I passed Colonel Jack Jones. Remember the guy that was lost at sea? And going up this hill, I passed Colonel Jack Jones, who was in command of our regiment, laying on his back with half of his head shut off. It looked as though a piece of shell had struck him, splitting his face and head. After passing him, I came to a man lying on the ground where he had the protection of the crest of the hill. This is a good story, too. He was not shooting, but lying as close to the ground as he could. <coughs> he said to me, You better not go up there. You will get shot. <laughs> no. I passed him without making my reply. When I got to the top of the hill, I raised my old infield rifle and was taking deliberate aim at a Yankee on the side of the mountain when a ball struck me, passing through my thigh. When the ball struck me, my gun fell from my hands and I went hopping back down the hill. The man that I had passed said to me, I told you that you would get shot if you went up there. <laughs> It, you know, it's strange, you know, Loki, Loki I, I'd have to look up what source is what, but I found the source that Fonz used in his book, and then there was a second story with Loki telling the exact same story. 
that I just read to you. I, I read you the second half, not the Fonz one he used right here. But to show you how it varies in the in the source that Fonz used in his book, he didn't put that he didn't put that conversation between him and that other rebel in there. And I thought it it, it really added something to it. And going up there, of course he did. And that's how rebels do it, right? Okay. So, what we're going to do is, we're going to take this darn hill. Okay, so what I want you to imagine, you can do this a lot better than I can describe it. If you're hardcore, where'd the guy go with the Grateful Dead shirt? He ought to be the one, that, now we need, always need hippies out here leading the charge. <laughs> If you think about it, if you're hardcore, you'll go right through those bushes. That's what Jerry Garcia would do. All right? As you get up toward there, if that doesn't, if you don't like that, I would go to the left, follow the road if you'd like to, or you can go up this trail, this path. But where I want to meet you, ladies and gentlemen, is we will set up just like we were when we first started this tour at 2.30. What I want you to do before you walk, though, is now you have to use your imagination. I've given you all the color I can. You should know where the units are. You should know what they're doing. You should know what their objective is. This is the reason you come out here on July 2nd. So you can be here at the actual place, at the actual time, and you can follow in the footsteps of these men. Your imagination is going to serve you a lot better than any descriptions that I can. So you're in the last footsteps of these Georgians. I'll see you at the tree. Two, one. <laughs> Thank you, Joe. I appreciate that. All right, the Georgians sweep up here. As, as I said at the beginning of the tour, the Smith's guns would have been up the top of the ridge, uh, right up there by the 99th Pennsylvania. You can, you, if you follow Civil War combat, then you know by walking this ground that they can smell it right now. They can see it, they can feel it, and they can they are on the verge of getting it. Now, Smith Gunners has three 10-pound parrots up on top of the ridge. Smith knew when he deployed the guns, ironically, that he'd probably lose them. If he didn't know them, his boss, the big boss, came by, uh, General Henry Hunt, and told him, you're going to lose your battery. Oh, that's okay, that's nice. Before Smith... Before the Georgians got there, Smith told them to leave when they ran from the guns to please take, and use word please, please take everything, all the implements, all the tools, everything they had, just run with them. Why are they taking the tools with them? You can't turn the guns on them. You disable the guns by doing that. Okay, so the Georgians come charging up to the top. Now look, every Confederate on this hill captured this gun, okay? There is no, I don't, there is no deciding who captured the gun. Any unit that was in this vicinity captured those guns. So it's just a matter of, of who, who got there first. Uh, probably, that's hard to say, I would think the Georgians would have the path of least resistance. But who knows, because in short order, once they get out of here, the 124th New York falls back. You've got uh, rear guard action for as much as they can. They're holding on. I take it right inside the woods or along the edge of the woods. The Georgians are shooting it out with them on the top of this hill. The 4th Maine is still below there. They're now getting pelted from those woods over there across from where we just came from by the 48th Alabama. They start to fall back. When they fall back, the 99th Pennsylvania comes charging. It makes a counter charge through the woods. And if the monument is in the correct place, they made it all the way back and recovered Smith's guns. But once they get Smith's guns momentarily, they get themselves into a jam because they're surrounded by Confederates. And they're on top of the hill. So what do the Confederates start doing? They start shooting them from three sides. So the 99th Pennsylvania has to retreat. In the midst of all this, the 6th New Jersey is coming up in support. The 6th New Jersey, despite its monument placement, does not have that high a casualty rate, which leads me to believe that they were probably just remained in support instead of a full-born assault, but they are on the field. The last unit to come on the field is the Mozart Regiment from New York, the 40th New York. 
and they come, I think they got a bunch of guys from Massachusetts, ironically, but they come onto the field, and as they start to deploy across the field right through here, then they're going to be uh, making one last counterattack and basically the rear guard, if you will, for all these Federals as they start to retreat back through there. So the Georgians end up, and the Texans end up capturing those guns. And they are only one of, those three guns they capture here are one of, on three of six guns that the Confederates uh, keep possession of for the rest of the battle. I think there's first day they get a couple maybe. Yeah. The other one. Yeah. All right. So. Uh, 20th Georgia writes, the order was obeyed. This is J.D. Waddle of the 20th Georgia, the final charge. The order was obeyed by the regiment with promptness and alacrity. And the charge upon the hill and battery executed courageously and successfully. I wish I could write like that. In the space of 15 minutes, the hill was carried and three 10-pound paired guns captured. Our battle flag, he writes, is marked with 87 holes in it, the 20th Georgia, 38 of which came from many balls, the remainder from the character of the rents, fragments of shells tearing through it. Um, the Confederates now had overrun the Devil's Den area, and it had been a bloody affair for both sides. The importance, though, of the Devil's Den area is largely dependent as far as this area of the field because that mountain right there, Little Round Top. Now let me back up and say something that, that really grabbed me since I got, since it's cool out here, supposedly. Let me say something what I brought away from reading all these Georgians' accounts. It's all a matter of where you start with is how you perceive the battle. Today, when I came out here, well, the first thing I told you that the end of Sickles line is right here. The Smith's guns were right there, all right? And that, you know, the rest of the brigade extended over there. I told you where every unit was. To the Georgians coming on the field, though, it looked completely different. If you're attacking from this direction, going this way, it appeared to the Georgians that this was a defense in depth. They didn't know that the hill was unoccupied. They didn't see it unoccupied. From the time they got here, Strong Vincent and Weed's brigades were deployed up there. So if you're advancing from this area and you look this way, it looks like a defense in depth with one line right here, all right, and then another line up on the mountain. So in other words, it looks like they set it up intentionally to the Georgians. And they get through taking this hill and that's pretty much all they want. Because to advance over the hill is to do what? It's to die. It comes within range of, uh, who would that be, Rittenhouse by this time, of the guns up on Little Round Top in that area. And so, they're so discombobulated that they don't advance any further. Most of the fighting, as I said earlier, would be done by the 15th Georgia in the woods. Now, the losses, the 15th Georgia, as I said, has 368 men. They will lose 171. The 20th Georgia is 350 men. Remember, they got more, they got more shelter. Remember when I pointed it out to you? They lose 137 out of 350. The 17th Georgia, who probably has the most shelter coming up, the least resistance. How about we put it that way? Out of 350 men, they lose 103. And the second Georgia working their way around, surprisingly to me, out of 348 men, only loses 102 men. All right. So that is Rock Benning's Georgia Brigade. All right. Now I have one last story for you if you got it in you. You got it in you, Zeus? Of course. All right. <laughs> what do you got? Well, let me see. Kill it. Oh, that's a good job. 
<laughs> All right, you want to read the title. Face the camera. Boy. See the cameras for posterity. <laughs> if he gets the scholarship for college, I'm getting a paternity test. <laughs> you have my good side right here? All right. Taylor didn't find that funny. All right. This is the weirdest story you're ever going to hear. Okay, and this is by John M. Bowden of the Second Georgia. And what's the title of the story, Ben? Bear story. The Bear Story. And this actually happened. I'd like to say that we don't you go out looking for it, all right? But we have had this past week a black bear sighted in the park. And we're very excited about that. They usually pass through, one usually passes through about every two to three years. So we'd appreciate it if you police yourself if you're out eating on the battlefield right here. And this poor woman is about to have a heart attack uh, coming through. All right, now listen to this. All right, let me see, topography. Potomac, mountainous area. I think you'd be all right. All right, here we go. It might not be uninteresting to the children to relate here a real bear story, one in which I saw the bear with my own eye. In the mountainous woods not far from the battlefield, some of our soldiers captured a black bear and carried him back with us in our retreat toward the Potomac River. While the dense woods and the rocky, rough topography of the country about Gettysburg, under ordinary conditions, might be an attractive hiding place for a bear. I often wondered whether this particular one was tame and going about with an Italian wander mate and what became of his mate. He was not muzzled. He was a not bear. muzzled. <laughs> Go ahead. He was not muzzled as a bear in captivity usually is. Be that as it may, I feel sure that the bear soon found his. The situation between the boom of cannon and the roar of musketry, altogether too uncomfortable, if not entirely unsafe. Like John Bull, his sympathizers must have been with the South, for he threw himself into the arms of the Johnny Rebs, who used them for a while as a mascot, but finally, no doubt, Converted him into states. Of which... <laughs> that falls right there. <laughs> you can go around the world. You won't ever hear anybody eating a bear at Gettysburg. Now, how many of you ever heard that story? Go ahead, tell them, Ben. That's some good eats. <laughs> of which they were sadly in need. But really, whatever became of the bear, I never knew and could only testify that if he were ever converted into snake, I never got him. If he was ever converted into steak, he never got it. Right there. That's too bad. Yes. One more, and I'll let you go. Uh, you want to read it? All right. I want to. I want to close with this before Ben. If if, if uh, before Ben reads this, I want you to know that. Um, you know, you just don't get any better for a battlefield than the title of Devil's Dead. I mean, do you get any better? I have people that come up to the battlefield and their first time here, and all they want to do is go see Devil's Den because of the name. And they've heard about it and everything. I don't know if you could ever have the Bloody Lane at Antietam, you know, the Bloody Pond at Shiloh. I mean, these are names that just stand out. Devil's Den, the problem with Devil's Den in the aftermath of the battle is, ladies and gentlemen, is this right here, what we've been crawling on all day long. This whole area is made out of what? Wow. Right, of rocks. So what are you going to have a lot of in the aftermath of this battle? Bodies. And you're going to have rocks. So what do you do with it? What do you do with the bodies that are out here? People for years would be coming out here to Devil's Den, and they'd be talking about, uh, for instance, they would shove the rebs down in some of the crevices in the rocks. And by the time the burial party got ready to had time to inter them somewhere, uh, they had bloated between the rocks. They had jammed in between the rocks and they couldn't get them out. And so for years after the battle, people would walk among Devil's Den and the bones as they would decompose would fall to the ground. 
as the body would come. So you would look in these crevices like around the parking lot and so forth, and you would see piles of bones out there, you know? So that, that is what it was like in this area. I want to say um, that I don't know if I could, I could go through this with them. All right, he's going to read to you what it looked like. <laughs> the rebels in passing over the rocks were shot and fell down between the rocks into stagnant water and blue mud. When I visited this place, I clambered. I clambered down to these miserable looking beings. I almost strangled from the effects of the smell caused partly by the decomposed bodies. The crevice is from 10 to 15 feet deep. It is a dangerous to pass over these rocks. Some skeletons of late have been hooked up with iron hooks attached to long poles. You will remember the rebels buried their own dead here. Scarcely any graves were dug here, Scarlet. <coughs> They dragged them to where they could throw them into some crevices and tumbled them in and threw a few stones on them and thus left them. The visitors shocked at every step while passing over this vast charnel, charnel house. As soon as the bodies began to decay, the stones began falling down among the skeletons, thus exposing all that each grave contained. It is not pleasant to the finer feelings of the human breast to see the frames of men in every position conceivable. Here all the arms and legs that were shot off were not gathered and buried, but are laying about among the rocks. I saw in a circle of one by four legs lying with shoes and sock stockings on it, while hands lay withering in the sun. If ever there was a place named you're not going to say that. If ever there was a place named hell on earth, this was it. Ladies and gentlemen, isn't that, that description that he just, that Ben just read to you, is that not the reason that we come out here? And I mean that both for the north and the south. Is that not the reason we come out here? That's why you're out here 150 some odd years later, so that these men will not be forgotten at the end of the day. On behalf of Benjamin Lee Atkinson and Matt Atkinson, we thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you.